Welcome listeners, viewers, Bumblefoot fans, trolls, people being forced to listen or watch by somebody else, or anyone who is hearing my voice right now. I welcome you to the show, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Uh, but before we get to our guest, I do want to give everyone who has subscribed to my YouTube channel a big shout out, and I uh, really appreciate that. So if you haven't yet done that, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel because I do have some great guests and some great content planned. And speaking of great guests, it doesn't get much greater than my guest today, Ron Bumblefoot Thal. He is one of the greatest guitar players alive today. Uh, he has been involved in so many projects. And of course, he was in Guns N' Roses for nine years and played on the Chinese Democracy album. So this is very exciting for me because I'm a diehard Guns N' Roses fan. Uh, but if you go down the Bumblefoot rabbit hole, you will find he's done so much great work, including his solo stuff. He plays guitar in all, in all these all-star bands like uh, Art of Anarchy and Sons of Apollo. And he sings and plays guitar and fronts the band, the 80s band Asia. He uh, is producing the Dodies, who I've had on the show, and, and some other stuff, like with produced Run DMC or DMC's uh, st- uh, uh, album. And I think he's still working with him, he says. He does tons of guest appearances. He teaches. He has a band camp. Tons of film and TV work. He is everywhere. So we don't cover everything in this episode, but I do think we cover a lot. And I hope I didn't miss anything. Uh, so enjoy this episode with Bumblefoot. Well, welcome, Bumblefoot, to the show. How are you doing? I can't hear you now. What happened? Oh, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay. It's like you went mute for a second. Uh, well, welcome. How, how the hell are you? I'm good, good. Just how was Ireland? I got to keep slapping my face to stay awake. You just got back from Ireland, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, how was that? Mm. Man, so good. I love, love that place. And we're up all the way north at the pretty much the northernmost point. And it's just so much, there's so much space and everything is just such a calm, relaxed vibe. Uh, perfect place to make an album. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's real. I heard it's really green there because I think it rains a lot. So, yeah. It is beautiful green hills and just sheep and cows and grass everywhere and history and old forts from 4,000 years ago and like all kinds of stuff. Do you get to explore a little bit while you're off, have a day off or something, get to go to the the castles and things like that? Yeah, we, I timed everything so that we would have just enough time to do other things. So the band, they got to do a gig and they did, uh, an acoustic show that was filmed mm. that we're going to edit and have a nice acoustic thing. Plus doing the whole album and doing some sightseeing and, and just getting a taste for what it's like there. Just going to a pub and having a pint of Guinness and watching some local musicians playing songs with an accordion and all kinds of stuff. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. So you, you're producing the Dodies. I've had them on the show. Great band. Yeah. It was interesting to see though, like how you recorded, you're recording in like a shipping crate or something. All kinds of stuff to get real sounds. Uh, oh, so yeah, not just those keeps... shipping crate. There's other stuff too. Oh yeah, yeah. We uh, did things where the studio we recorded at, the drum room, um, was pretty tight sounding, and I, we needed more just bouncing for the sound, more reflections and everything. Mm. So we got parts of an old uh, van that was taken apart and sheets of metal and all kinds of things that we're putting on the walls around the drums. And then I got these two metal buckets that had different tunings and the higher pitch one I put aimed at the snare drum with a microphone in it. So every time it hits the snare, all the sound just echoes in this thing and I had a a mic catching all of that. And then in the hallway, I had another bucket that had a darker sound to it with an omnidirectional microphone grabbing everything from there. And I'm telling you, those buckets made the entire drum sound. Hmm. It's a different room. It sounds like a whole different thing. That's and interesting. I can pop it on right now. It's yeah. It's all about sound and being resourceful and using what you have. Yeah, and you you kind of like to experiment with that. You're kind of like a mad scientist with guitar. Didn't you take one all the frets off one of your guitars and put coins on it or something like that? I've done a lot of crazy shit. <laughs> yeah, I thought this was the the most adorable thing though when you were 7 years old and you started playing music, you had you had shows and you had cups of confetti 
and you had merchandise. And I mean, that's pretty innovative for a seven year old to have all that kind of stuff at, at such a young age. Oh, well, being a lifelong Kiss fan since the age of five, <laughs> you know, they were the guidance for all the kids that went on to become musicians. Uh, watching them, everything they did, they were the, the template, they were the everything, they were the how-to book. Right. So at that age, yeah, I figured out, I just, again, being resourceful, use what you have. So we would make merch, just hand-drawn comic books of, you know, little stick figures and spaceships. It's so cute. And we would throw confetti, making our own cups of confetti to throw up in the air. And we would multi-track record using a cassette player in the corner of the room recording and our little nylon string acoustic guitars a foot away and the drums 10 feet back for levels and then playing that back and having another one recording while we sang so that we had the recording of our music that was playing back we would sing as that played to it and then have another recorder recording it so that's how we would overdub and and multi-track that's amazing. Yeah. So you've been doing this a long time. So you've learned all sorts of tricks and things along the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you still have so, the uh, Swiss cheese guitar too? that Ibsen uh, Roadstar, the yellow guitar full of holes? The Ibanez Roadstar. Yes, I do. I have it. Yeah. Wow. It still has the holes in it. That's amazing. And then um, so tell me about uh, this. I found this interesting that you you dropped out of high school, but then you ended up uh, teaching at the music colleges. How does that work? Because don't you have to have a de degree to teach at the college or is it just based on skill? They deemed me qualified. So well, yeah. uh, <laughs> that's the good. Boss of the school said, yeah, he gave me the okay. That's awesome. And yeah, I studied on my own, even though I, I, I sort of took the, I guess the long road and the hard road for a lot of things. Uh, but yeah, in the end, you get there. That's amazing. I want to play some drum tracks. I want you to hear the difference okay. that these buckets make. I don't know how good the sound is going to be, but here's what I'll do. First, I will let you hear the drums. Okay. Maybe I should aim this so that it doesn't recognize it as background noise. Let me know if you hear these drums. Okay. Yeah, I can hear that. So that is the drums without the buckets. Okay. Now I'm going to show you what the buckets sound like. Here's the one on the snare. And the one in the hallway. And when we add them to the kit, first I'll have it without, and then I'll add the snare, and then I'll add the hallway. And watch how it just makes, it just fattens up everything. Oh. Now, whole bucket. Take it away. Yeah, I could definitely. There was definitely a fatter sound to the when you combined to them. That's, that's crazy. It it's just like, how do you, you just figure that out just by trial. A lot of it's trial and error, just trying different things. And I oh, decades of experience of trying to find ways using what you have. It's kind of like being the professor on Gilligan's Island and making things out of coconuts. <laughs> so that's pretty much what I tend to do in the studio is I'll make things out of coconuts. Yeah. Are you now? Are you still? Um, are you producing the upcoming album by by uh, Run DMC or it's it's DMC Generation Kill? It's a super group with the guy uh, with Daryl from D, uh, Run DMC, right? Oh, that was years ago. Was it years ago? They okay. Had formed, that was about five years ago. Five years ago. Okay. And I'm still working with DMC. Actually, I'm are working you? on a, a song with him uh, that he's guesting on for this artist in Toronto, and I just did all the music for it, and. Yeah, yeah. So that that was Generation Kill, and they made this whole album with DMC, and I added guitar to it and did the mixing and everything, and it came out five years ago. But uh, between the label and all kinds of stuff, it just didn't move forward. Oh. But it was a great album. It was really good stuff. So now Generation Kill, they're doing their thing. 
And I think their new album, if it's not out, I think they just put out a song, I know, because they sent it to me. And, and great stuff. They are such a great band. Yeah. How do you, you must, you must spend a lot of time working on music, but I mean, I'm looking at all the stuff you've released, all these th people you're producing and, and all these things that you're doing. I mean, are you just like working 16 hour days or what? Uh, I'm limiting it now to eight hour days. Are you really? Okay. Yes. And just doing as much as I can in eight hours. I used to work myself to the bone. I'm not doing that anymore. Life's okay. too short. I want to take more time to, to just enjoy and live. So That's... I'm doing... I'm still working my ass off, but I'm just not going to be a slave to it anymore. Okay. Right? So did you used to work 16 hour days did, in the beginning? Uh, about 15 to 20 years ago, I was working 40 hour stints. I would work for 40 hours straight and then sleep eight hours and then 40 hours and sleep eight hours and 40, 40 hours. Yeah. And I was just producing band after band plus doing my own albums and doing stuff for TV shows and all kinds of stuff. It was nonstop. Wow. And there was no time to sleep. But I should have made time. The world can wait. Yeah. So they, you were able to survive on that, like on eight hours of sleep and 40 hours of... That's crazy. Yeah, but it's not the way... It's not a good way to live. It's not living at all. Uh, no. I used to love pushing myself to the limit. And I often did. Uh, but that's not sensible no you know, when i was younger maybe now fuck that <laughs> yeah so when your career started as a solo artist I, I love the story where you sent the demo to the head of shrapnel records and he said it was the most impressive demo he's ever received but why did it take him five years to sign you then why didn't he sign you like on the spot well he offered me a deal but he wanted me to be an instrumental artist and he uh wanted to put a band together uh, at the time, it was, I still remember the, the names he mentioned. Was it, uh, I think it was, was it Greg Bissonette or? Ooh. Yeah, it was Greg Bissonette on drums and Jeff Pilsen on bass. He wanted to wow. make a band of those two guys and me. But at the time, I had my own band and I had my own music. And I wanted to stay focused on that and try to make that happen. So we did some uh compilation albums together his brother also had a record label mark mark varney mm. and i did a few of his compilation albums the cds where just it was all instrumental guitar music and it would be guys like greg howe and sean lane and and guthrie govan and we would all just put a song on and they would put out albums of that stuff so i did a bunch of them and finally in 94 uh, he told me that uh, Mike Varney told me that he was making a subsidiary label that was going to have vocal music in it because I was always a singer and a guitar player. I wasn't just mm -hmm. an instrumental guitar player. You know, I was a singer as well. And all my music, I sang and it was that, you know, it was like a band. It was like rock music, you know, not just instrumental. Mm -hmm. shred. So when he said he was doing that, I was like, all right, let's do it. And I was signing to the label with my band doing the band music, doing the stuff you know that I've been doing and releasing. But once I signed, he said, you know what, can we just do an instrumental album just to start things off? And I was like, all right. So I did an instrumental album that was the debut album in 1995, The Adventures of Bumblefoot. It's a weird album with every song named after a different animal disease. And, and is that the one with the cover where it's like the foot and it's like bumblebee looking and? Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah that, that, that's cool sort of cartoonish creature so that yeah and then two years later it came out with an album that had vocals on it and that was called hermit and then after that i started my own record label and started putting out albums as bumblefoot and I had distributors around the world and business was good so at that point i had my own record label and distributors and doing that and doing tours internationally in europe and wherever and was making music for all the tv shows and and video games and was producing a million bands and keeping real busy and just living a very musical life hence 40 hour yeah you know, 40 hours at a time like getting all of that done uh and from there started teaching at the university and and doing that as well so teaching semesters there it's amazing how so, much yeah. stuff you do 
I think it. I think it's. Fa- Sorry, go on. No, I was just saying it, it was a lot. It's a lot. I think it's fascinating though that I mean I listen to your guitar playing. It's amazing and all your uh, your solo work, everything you've done. But it's fascinating to me that you you don't like playing guitar solos. You don't like the attention that you're you're shy. Is that you don't like playing them on stage or do you, even in the studio you don't like to do it? Oh, I like in the studio. It's okay. Just- I don't like when all the eyes are on me, which is makes no sense whatsoever. It's like, okay, so you're fronting your band, but yeah. you hate, you know, what can I say? That's me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do, like, it's just a weird mix of contrasting senses of being, I guess. It's like you love to put it out there and, and just you know, explode with energy and give it to everybody. And, and, but at the same time, it's like, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so back in the day before, like you were doing these 40 hour, uh, stints or whatever, when you were working, like before you were actually working and you were just like learning to play guitar, how many hours a day were you practicing? Ah, uh, so let's see, going back to those years between, I guess, age seven to maybe let's say 15, 16, something like that. Yeah. I'd be taking guitar lessons and yeah, I remember it all vividly. My brother played drums. So we would spend hours in the basement just jamming and I would learn songs on my own. I would just drop the needle, old school, listen for three seconds, lift the needle, keep the sound going in my head, grab the guitar, match up the sound. And at one point, what I would do is every day I would try and learn an album, an entire album. So I would put on whatever there was at the time. This is around the age 10, 11, 12. So I put on Scorpion's Blackout and I would listen and I would play along and you know, songs, they, they repeat themselves, the parts, the verses, the choruses. And so I would work my way through the song and try and get the song down as I was listening so that by the end, I would know the song. And then the next song, the next song, and do an entire album. So I would just, just to exercise my ears and my retention and being able to match up, you know, what I hear to, to the playing and to get a good sense of anticipating what was coming next and getting to know how people wrote. Uh, that's what I would do. So I do a lot of that on top of learning classical and jazz and everything with guitar teachers and going to school and having the band and recording and writing and doing all that and gigging. I uh, started playing bars when I was 14 and wow. my band was called Paradox and we were like a progressive metal band and half, we did a ton of covers, like half our set would be Rush and then we would do Maiden and Ozzy and all the cool stuff that was around in the early 80s and, and Priest and uh, yeah, lots of Maiden. Was that before the Leonard Nimoy band, the cover band, or? This was before that. Okay, okay, yeah. Because then you did that one. 1983, 84, (laughs) 85. And yeah, so when we throw in some originals in there as well. So you've always, that's crazy. You've always been so busy. Well, yeah, so the latest album is called Little Brothers Watching, but I saw that you also have a single, Planetary Lockdown. Is that part of an, an upcoming full album that you're going to do? Or was that just a one-off? Yeah, the years have been flying by that Little Brother album now. I mean, it's getting old. It's six little years old, yeah. Up. Yeah. It's not so little anymore. <laughs> so I've been, since then, two Art of Anarchy albums, two Sons of Apollo albums, uh, tons of stuff. I mean, more stuff than I could even remember. Uh, and <laughs> nonstop touring the, every corner of the world and i've been pretty much slowly been working on a new album and this time i think i'm going to do another instrumental album okay so we would have a song i put out two years ago called chintaku it's a indonesian word term and means my love and i'll put that on there in planetary lockdown that song i'll put on there and i've been working on a few more Okay. Well, that's exciting. Well, I'm, I'll look forward to that. And then, like you said, the Sons of Anarchy. Now that's still active, right? It's with the uh, Creed singer, Scott Stapp and uh, disturbed bassist, John Moyer. Now, here's what you just said. You said Sons of Anarchy. Or, did I, I say Sons, Sons of Anarchy? I meant Art yes, of Anarchy. This is the curse <laughs> of having those two fucking Damn bands. it. 
Because yeah. one is Art of Anarchy, one is Sons of Apollo. So you're so right. Everyone I combine them. Myself, Shit. All the time, I'm like, Sons of Anarchy. I mean, Art of Apollo. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> but always, Sons of Anarchy. I mean, you know, that <laughs> show, yeah. So it's a great show. Yeah. But no, Art of Anarchy. That is so still active, Art right? Of Anarchy, uh, not right now. It's on a no. big hiatus. Okay. That band has been nothing but singer troubles. Yeah. So. Well, obviously with Wyland, yeah, and he passed away. But um, but so there's problems with Scott uh, Stapp, the Creed singer. Well, the band in since yeah, we put out the album in 2017, and because there's legal stuff going on, I'm not going to talk about it sure. until that's all settled. But yeah, okay. Uh, well, then, yeah. what about Sons of Apollo? Because I think you guys had shows scheduled for 2020, but then obviously they were canceled. Are you going to reschedule those shows? Because I know you have the latest album is a. Uh, uh, was a 2020 album so yeah yeah we started touring we did little u.s run and then uh we were in europe we had 20 shows to do right as covid was exploding and we got four shows out of it and then had to throw all gear in storage and race home before the borders were closed mm. in early march of last year yeah so we were one of the first bands to start canceling Mm. And <laughs> we were out there and, and I remember telling one of the promoters, we had to tell him, like, look, we need to cancel the tour. And, and he's like, there's no cases out here. You guys are, you know, it's nothing. You're fine. We're going to sue you. Blah, blah, blah. And then a week later, their country was shut down. They're like, oh, can we reschedule? <laughs> yeah. 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 So we, some things had to be canceled. Some stuff is rescheduled for next year. And we'll see, see how it goes, see what happens. I mean, this break has been a quite a reflective time for a lot of people. And I think it changed a lot of people's perspective on things. Like for me, I don't want to tour anymore. I don't want to tour so much. I'm being home for the first time for so long and reconnecting to family and to myself and to be in, in the studio every day where I could be creative again, as opposed to just living this life of 24 hour increments with just it. I want to keep making music and mm -hmm. I'm not going to spend so much time on the road. Uh, yeah. Being else. on the road's tough. The older you get, I would think too, it's harder to, when you're young, it's like, it's all this exciting. It's fun. And then when you've done it for that long, I would think you get burned out. It's just, it's, it's no life. You don't have a real life. You know, it's not how I want to live anymore. You know, I've done enough of it and I'll still go out and play, but now I'm being, you know, I'm, I'm pacing it. I'm saying no a lot more. I used to spend my whole day in life, you know, just living out of a suitcase. Mm. That was no fucking life at all. Mm -hmm. I want, you know, everything passed me by and I missed it all. And I'm not doing that anymore. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that's good to hear then. I mean, I want you to be happy and I like all the stuff that you've, you've done, you've done all these uh, theme songs and the, the film and TV. That's a, that's a pretty lucrative thing to do, right? You get a lot of offers for that still. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fun. It, I love when there's something visual that you have to sort of make the sound version of what you see and, and the mood and all that. So I've done like indie horror films and those are a blast mm -hmm. and get real intense with that. Uh, yeah. I love doing that. Yeah. I mean, for the people that don't know, I mean, it's, I don't know if there's a big trivia thing, but you do the theme song for that metal show. That was, that was a pretty uh, famous song that a lot of people heard and like you did some video games and then tell me about this. Are you, uh, you're going to be in some TV show, like you're appearing in a TV show called uh, is a show called scrawl. What is that? Oh, that thing. Yeah. It's that's also shelved until further notice oh. just because of COVID. Okay. They can't film it. Cause oh. yeah. So yeah, there's so many things that are just, all right. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll get to it in 2022 or 2023. Yeah. Do you like appearing in and acting and stuff? Cause you, I'm mean, like I said, you've done these, uh, the, like you were kind of acting in some of this stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. Okay. It's definitely fun. Yeah. There was one horror movie where, uh yeah i got hit over the back of the head with a bottle and come out of it and i'm strapped in this dude's basement and <laughs> wait he, shit which horror movie is that i gotta see that slices my throat and they actually they edited 
that scene down. I have a version of it where you see the cut and the blood and everything. He lifts my beard and, and like <laughs> slices my throat. Uh, but I think in the version that that the distributor has, they took that out, I think. Which movie is but, that? Yeah. Oh, what was that one? Damn, let me, you know what? I'm going to jump on IMDb right now. Oh, well, I'm on there right now. I, I got it. Is it uh, the, Evangelist. the Evangelist? Okay, Jack Hayes. You put, Okay, I'll have to check that out. So yeah, you're a big <laughs> fan of horror movies. Um, tell me about this one because I heard you talking about the uh, Serbian film. I've always wanted to see this, but I feel like it's banned in the U.S. How did you see that? I, there's always a way. <laughs> Do you have to go to a different country to because you're traveling so much or you have some sort of bootleg copy? Because if you have the bootleg, you should give it to me. I want to see that, but I, it's like I can't watch it. Why is it banned? Is it really that bad? Uh, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> really? It's really fucked up. Yeah. Shit. I love those kind of movies, though. It's crazy. And you are going to love this one. I need to see that. Well, are you a fan of... I'm going to make sure that you do. Okay. Are you a fan of The Exorcist? Sure. Yeah. Have you ever done research on like... Because I know you're you're into like science and stuff like that. Have you ever done research on that true story behind that movie? Do you believe in that kind of stuff? Well, I'm pretty skeptical about things in life. But at the same time, if you can't prove something happened or you can't prove it didn't happen, you have to accept all possibilities. Mm Mm-hmm. So if someone says, you know, I was possessed and I was floating and I was making shit spin around the room and I was speaking in tongues. And if I can't prove, if I can't disprove it, you know, if I can't prove it's true, but I can't prove it's untrue, I have to accept the possibility of either. That's how I look at it. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. I'm skeptical too, but I'm also interested, like, because there's so much evidence people saying that it wasn't just the one kid. It was like all these witnesses, like 48 witnesses or something saw some weird stuff, including one that was like a, a scientist for the, uh, that had worked on the atomic bomb came in and saw this kid and goes, something crazy is happening here. Maybe. Yeah. I can't prove it either way. And, and even then, even certain things can be true that can't be proven. If you get into mathematics of, of Kurt Godel and stuff like that, uh, you know, there are possibilities beyond what, you know, we can comprehend. So, so who, who am I to say I don't believe it or I do believe it? Yeah. You know? Do you read a lot? Because I know you're really into science and like astronomy and all that kind of stuff. Do you, do you read a lot of that kind of stuff or do you, do you spend a lot of time researching it for fun? I do. Every, every morning I spend a good hour just trying to wake my brain up. Oh, yeah. okay. That's right. That's connected. I feel like science and math, it's connected to playing guitar, isn't it? In a way, it's like the same skill set in a way. Pretty much. Music is sort of the... Uh, I guess music theory is almost, you could say, the uh, the math of emotions, in a way. Yeah. Is that now? Is that part of your recovery? Because I know you were in that car accident and you had to go through some recovery. Is that part of the something they suggest to like work on your brain and stuff? Because th- th- you had some weird things. Like you said something like, um, you know, weird things happen. Like your porn taste changed. I mean, that's like the, <laughs> such an interesting thing to to read about. I was like, what? Like, and now you prefer? I don't know if this is still true. You at one point you preferred broccoli over steak. I'm like. This is fascinating. Well, yeah, the, yeah, my brain got uh, moved around a little bit and some personality traits kind of changed. Uh, yeah, you know, shit happens. But yeah, it was a car accident and nerve damage and had to really work hard to bounce back. But that's, that's life. You want to bounce back, you got to work hard. Yeah. And then you, you said that food helped you too, right? Uh, changing your diet. Like you were using food as food was uh, helped you more than the pain pills or whatever from the pain. Oh yeah. The doctors were just prescribing all kinds of stuff that was just making more inflammation and just, they were basically putting a band aid over a wound, but they weren't treating the wound and it was just making things worse. So finally I just had to do a massive cleanse and get all of that shit out of my system and found that for me, at least uh, just a good paleo diet was the key and reducing mm-hmm. inflammation that made the pain go away. And so you're and still sticking to that? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, sometimes I, I misbehave a little bit, but nothing that a, a 24-hour fast the next day can fix. Oh, you do the 24-hour fast? That's... Yeah, yeah. I do fasting every once in a while, 16, 24 hours. 
uh, more. Yeah. Nice. It's good. It, it definitely, I think sometimes I feel better when I'm starving. <laughs> yeah. It's like you have more energy. I think when you, when you, when you fill up, that's like, for me, at least when I get to, especially with too many carbs, it just makes me sleepy. Yeah. I keep away from carbs. Yeah. Dangerous. Well, God, so many awards that you sent me this list, you know, you sent me all these talking points and, and one of them was like all these awards that you have, like voted number one guitarist and you know, this number four guitarist, all these, does, does that stuff even matter to you at this point? Are you like, eh, I don't care. Or is it like still feel really good to get those kind of things? It always feels good <clears throat> to get a pat on the back or get a thank you or just to be acknowledged or recognized or appreciated. That's just human. Uh, in any way, uh, does it you know, does it mean you're the best or the worst or anything? No, you know that that's nothing. It's you know it doesn't. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it shouldn't. What I'm saying is it, it shouldn't change how you feel about yourself. Like that's one thing I see a lot with musicians is you know like that stuff. You know it all feeds our ego is what it is. Everything and you got to keep your ego in check just in life. You know, I know I've played with people where if the room is really packed, you know, they're, they love what they do. If the room is empty, they hate what they do mm. and they feel, and if you really get into it, why you know, they feel like they're a failure if they didn't fill a room and they feel like a success if they did. And that's not necessarily the case. You know, you got to change how you define yourself and what matters to you and, and even the idea of success. You know, they could have, if you play for just one person, that one person is inspired and decides not to kill themselves and to go on and do something and they have a child that goes on to save the world. Uh, you are part of that <laughs> web. That's amazing. Yeah. Have you heard, have you had a lot of people tell you stuff like I'm sure you get stories like that where people yeah. are like they, they were inspired by your music for sure, right? Yeah, and that that's what I love most about it about being a musician. It's not what I get from other people like the the adornment and the you know the praise and all that shit. Like that's the part that makes me shine. It makes me crawl up and like stop looking at me like that thing. Uh it's more of when I can have an effect on other people in a positive way that it inspires them that's why i love teaching and why i love producing because it's helping other people do what they do and and you know just realize their own dreams so that's the thing it's it's i'm all about paying it forward that's Not so cool yeah rolling in it yeah yeah because there's a lot of guitar players i think that that don't want to teach and they don't want to help anybody else and they just want they're more introverted just want to play guitar and be left alone well, if you're introverted, yeah, and I'm, I'm a massive introvert for sure. Uh, there's that, but it doesn't mean that they don't want to teach or, you know, they just may not be comfortable doing it. Like they just, yeah, hmm. it doesn't, yeah, it's, everybody's different. You know, some people love to teach and hate to be on stage. Some people love to be on stage and hate to teach. Some people love both. Some people hmm. hate both. Oh, whatever it is, everybody's different and you should do what you're, you know, what you yeah. So you're, I mean, obviously you're one of the best guitar players in the world right now, I would say. Oh, now, no. <laughs> well, according to all these Absolutely. awards I saw, I mean, like you're, you know, all these rankings and stuff, but you're up there, right? So, but what is your relationship like with other guitar players? Is it competitive or do you guys like to help each other out or? No, it's, it's really for the most part, it's one big happy. Like I have this thing called the thread where it's like a dozen guitar players and we all just send each other just all kinds of funny memes and stories and just what we're doing and what's going on. And like every day we're emailing and wait, stuff who's like that. Can you say who's on this thread? Is it some of the best guitar players? It's some really cool people. Oh yeah. man. It was started by Jeff Watson from night Ranger. Oh, okay. And yeah, one of the greatest guitar players, my God, the stuff he did. I remember watching a show like a concert of them on TV when I was, maybe 11 years old and Jeff was doing this solo where he's playing the guitar like piano like doing these truly eight finger just, it's just amazing he is such an incredible musician guitar player and just a sweetheart of a guy so he started that thread mm -hmm. and we all jumped on it we just 
stay in touch and send each other what we're working on and and just mostly we talk about things other than music usually really what other kinds of things you talk yeah. about most guitar players don't sit around talking about guitar that's the last thing we want to talk about you know we're talking about everything else talk about life just normal shit yeah like what give me an example oh talking about electrical work they did on the house you know, hmm. putting in like new lighting or something hmm. or a movie they saw or just some funny story of something that happened when they were driving or a meal they ate or something like that. Like that's just, normal just shit. Re regular, regular shit. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. God, you have so many releases of these acoustic albums that you're doing. Um, is, so there's three of them. There's three acoustic EPs, the barefoot ones. Yeah. I did one in 2008. Yeah. And then when the pandemic hit and I was locked in the studio, uh, started busting out a few more. Yeah. And those, cause I think two and three are not on Spotify though. So are those ones that people need to buy. Uh, those are not on Spotify. They're on Bandcamp, but they stream on Bandcamp as well. You can just listen to them. Okay. And then I yeah, a few little videos stuck on youtube also yeah yeah it's you like, did all these covers like uh the, the beatles cover of because and nowhere man and and um oh, do yeah, you, with, with jeff and mike from 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 apollo yeah yeah do you like doing the that's fun to play the covers right it is it is to play the songs that you love and that inspired you hell yeah yeah and you played on uh elfson's album dave elfson uh from megadeth uh no cover which is i think it's all covers isn't it <laughs> yeah it's all just Covers done his way. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. So I know people will probably ask you about this a million times, but the double neck guitar, the reason for that is because of different tunings that you have on each of the necks, right? And that's why you have two of them so you can switch between the two. Well, it's not just different tunings, but the top neck is fretless. Yeah. And that's so, so you can slide. Totally, yeah, it's like having a slide on every fingertip and and you can make sounds that you normally wouldn't make. Let me see if I can get some sound up here. So let me shut this and shut this and turn this on. So I got a little bit of sound or not. But yeah, normally on a fretted guitar, you have those precise break points where the yeah. string will only vibrate you know, exact distances and give you the right pitches, but with a fretless guitar, it's like a cello or a violin where your finger just has to go in the right spot. So you can make all kinds of stuff where you're dragging. And you couldn't do that with a, a fretted because you would just hear all the bumps mm -hmm. it's too exact and you don't because you don't need the because that was the thing when i used to play guitar i sucked but i needed the frets to know what the hell i was doing but you've been playing long enough that you know where everything is you don't use the frets at all isn't that the point oh. of the frets well frets are just to give you the exact pitches that that you want to get the, you know so that you're in tune okay with a fretless uh, you just have to put your fingers there. And if you're off by a little bit, instead of... It'll be... Yeah. But that's no good. Now, what if you do the tapping? Is it... Is it easier to do the tapping on the fretless? Um, I think it's easier on a fretted. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. With the fretless... Because there's not as much sustain as there is uh, on a, on a fretted. A fretted, you have that that you know that exact sharp bump of the fret that the string vibrates off of, and you get more sustain with a fretless. With your fingertip and all, it kind of dulls it a little bit, so you have to press a little harder. Or what I do a lot of times is I use my fingernail and the side of my finger to get more sustain. So if I just use the fingertip, dies off, but with the fingernail, oh. keep going. 
And if you have enough distortion and drive on the amp, it'll just keep on going. It's cutting off a little, but yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, Zoom doesn't like guitars. Anymore. Ah, damn, damn you, Zoom! It sucks. <laughs> Man, you've played you played with so many cool people. Uh, you jammed with Lars Ulrich one time, and uh, your dream collaboration would be with uh, well David Bowie if he, but you know if it was somebody who's dead, and then uh, for live people it would be Dave Grohl. You, you've never jammed with Dave Grohl or played with him? No, I never have. Huh. Uh, Jam with a lot of people on that list of, you know, who would be your dream band? Who would you want to jam? Yeah. Live or dead? You know, every five minutes it'll change. It'll change. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Well, and you're yeah, a big fan George of... Harrison, and then it'll oh, be yeah. someone else, and then it'll be, you know, all different. Yeah. Well, you're a big fan of Tony Harnell, and I had him on the show, You and you played with him. In a, uh, the, was it Tony Harnell and the Wildflowers? That was it called, right? Yeah, we've done a bunch of stuff. A lot of gigs... A lot of acoustic stuff we've done. Plus, we did that whole album, yeah. Okay. Um, what about some of the other guests I've had? I noticed that you follow these people on Instagram, so you must know of them. Like, what are your thoughts of, like, John Karabi? I know he's got a new song out. He's great. You've never – have you played with him before? I don't think we've jammed unless we did something on Ship Rock together. But, yeah, he's such a – he's a cool guy, and what a fucking voice. Yeah. What about yeah. Uh, Steve Brown? He, he's, he's played in a lot of bands, and he's a great guitar player. Uh, yeah, Steve, we go back to when we were teenagers and we would play all the clubs in Jersey and, and the whole area. Yeah, he had Trickster, I remember before they got signed and I had my band. We, yeah, we would just play all over the place. Oh, that's cool. And then uh, how do you know Doc yeah, Coyle? Did you play with him? Yeah, we jammed on Shiprocked. We did some oh, okay. stuff. Yeah, he's, he's great. Yeah, he's a really interesting guy. Did you ever sit down and talk with him? He's like really like smart, introspective wise Very, person yeah. yeah he's fun Absolutely, to talk to yeah. he's got a good good brain and a good good soul yeah what about uh eric turner i'm a big i'm a big warrant fan i've had you follow him yeah do you have any reactions with him or did you did ever we, play with i'm him? trying to think like did we jam i don't know if we ever jammed well there you go that's a future one that's that's one to put on your bucket yeah. list and then um and Rob, Rob Carlisle, he from the Compulsions, you played on on his stuff, and I think that's what he he's originally gave me your email, and this is like a year in the making. But with Rob, like what what's uh, how'd you how'd you come across him? Did he reach? He must have reached out to you to play on the Compulsion stuff, right? Yeah, it was years ago. Mm. Uh, some of the Guns guys were working on his stuff, and you know we were all, you know, like I'm a originally a Brooklynite. He's a Brooklynite, and and I remember hanging out one time talking and, and yeah, cool dude. And then he asked me if I would come in and play on some of his stuff. So I did. That's so cool. You, do you do that for a lot of people? You play, do a lot of guest appearances? Now I do. I couldn't for the longest time because I was always on the road, oh. but being in the studio, now I could do a lot more of that. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, so we got to talk about your hot sauce too. Um, so yes. yes. <laughs> All right. I got you back. All right. So yeah. So the, the whole thing started with uh, somebody dared you to eat a pepper when you were 12 and you did. And then you became hooked on the hot sauce. Yeah. I love spicy food. And I would always put hot peppers on everything. And then people would give me hot sauces as birthday gifts or whatever. And, and half my fridge was just bottles of hot sauce. And, and just like music, you collect music and you get inspired by it and then you just want to start making your own. Same kind of thing. It's like, you know what? I got ideas for hot sauce. What about this with blueberry and this with this and that? Uh, so I teamed up with a company about nine years ago and, and in early 2013, put out a line of sauces with them. And then a few years ago, the company sold. So I put together my own team, manufacturer and and distributors and everything and rolled it back out in the end of 2019 and that is it okay and yeah there's three flavors right there's the sauce which is just kind of more like a mild sweet everyday kind of thing there's bumblelicious which is like a sweet and savory thing and then there's this is the one i want to try is the bumble fucked because supposedly this is the third hottest sauce in the world and it's got caffeine in it and stuff it sounds crazy it's a crazy sauce, yeah. Like you do like one drop, is it gonna kill you? Or I mean, how much can you how much can you take of it? 
One dot is enough to heat stuff up. A drop will heat up a whole plate of food. Yeah. Damn. So did they, I think you said they talked about this on that show, The Hot Ones, that YouTube show? Well, they did a blog. They did okay. a blog where where they named like the 10 hottest sauces in the world and they called that one number three. So number why, number three. we need to get you on that show. That show is a fun, if you watch that show, it's a fun show. You'd be oh, perfect. Yeah. Well, have you tried to get, get on that show or reach out to them? I wouldn't mind getting my sauces on that show. Well, yeah, yeah. you could do both. I mean, you go out there, you promote it and that'd be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be cool. Right on. Well, um, I like to end each episode with a charity. You've worked with so many. You worked with the MS Research Foundation, Operation Smile, Women's Health Organization. But the one you wanted to highlight was the uh, Rock Against uh, Dystrophy, right? Yes. So tell me about that. Ah, there's, there's this dude named Turbo that has an internet radio station. And he would go to every concert everywhere. And he has it. So it'd be like, who's that guy in the chair rocking out? And he's just the coolest fucking dude. So every year he would put together a concert to raise money for, you know, for all of it. And I've done as many as I could. Again, you know, touring and shit gets in the way. We were supposed to do it on the 18th coming up, but because of COVID and everything, I had to pull the plug mm. just because it's too risky at this point. But usually it's it's me and uh, Mark Tornillo and all the guys from, do you know, okay, Mark Tornillo, great dude, great singer. Uh, he sings for Accept for the past. Oh, okay. Years. Yeah. Is he the and, original singer or replacement? Uh, no, that was Udo Dirk Schneider. That's okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. So this is the new yeah. singer. Okay. So, yeah. And his band that he had in the 80s that I grew up listening to called T.T. Quick. Such a great, great band. So I remember him from back then. And all his bandmates, they would all play part of this thing as well. So it would just be this collection of all New York and New Jersey dudes just jamming and, and putting on a show and bringing people in and, and raising money for the charity. Oh, that's great. So, what so is that's the... the one that, being that we couldn't do the show, that's okay. the one that I want to mention that yeah. I'm hoping people look into it. What is the um, New Jersey and New York music scene like right now currently? I mean, I know obviously with COVID, the things are down, but like the last few years, like what is it? Is it a, is it a good scene? Is it thriving? Is it, do you feel like it's gotten worse? Well, there's definitely plenty of shows to go to and plenty to do and lots of bands to see. There's so many great bands in Jersey and, and New York. Uh, but when I think of it, I think of the late 80s where – you could easily just go hopping to 10 places in one night and every single place had three bands, original bands playing. And it was just the greatest scene. Like it was everywhere. Mm. Uh, such a great, great scene, such a good time. Yeah. So it's not as good uh, as it, as it was in the eighties, but it's nothing will ever be as good as the scenes were in the eighties. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, last question I got to ask you, uh, I forgot to ask about this, your goatee that that's like, yeah. that's like part of your trademark. What, what inspired that or what made you, and how long did it take you to grow it out that, that long? After a year it was there. Okay. And it was just such a big fro on my chin. It's a big giant chin fro. And I was like, I got to like do something with this. Uh, so I just started braiding it. And yeah, like right now I have it just in a little beard bun thing here. I got a little chin bun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, normally I would I have all this, this thing I made that has like chains and yeah. gold stuff in it. And, and I would just braid it in and still do that special occasions you just think but, of that on your own though like it wasn't you didn't yeah. see somebody else with, okay because it's very original i don't see i don't see too many other people doing that there's a few doing it now but yeah yeah just, i used to braid my hair like way back when oh, okay and now yeah that's cool just braid my braid my chin all right <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Is there anything I missed that when you want to promote here? We got the hot sauce. We got all your new projects, bands you're producing. We covered a lot of bases. And we I did. I thank you for that. Thank okay. you for uh, thank you for your time and and 
let me chat with you. Yeah, thank you. This was, a, and it's a, like I said, it's a year in the making and it was worth the wait. So I appreciate it. Well, the pleasure is mine and, and wishing you the best and all your listeners, wishing you all the best and stay happy and healthy and safe and musical. And I'll see you out there. All right. Thanks, Mobile Foot. I'll see you later. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. All right. Bye-bye. Well, all right. You made it through the whole interview. You're the real MVP. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you're on YouTube. I really appreciate it. Uh, did you enjoy this interview? Uh, let me know with a comment on YouTube or social media because uh, those comments, along with likes and shares, they help me out immensely. Uh, and, of course, make sure to follow Bumblefoot on social media and YouTube and Spotify or wherever you listen to his stuff. Uh, you got to keep up with him. He's doing so much stuff. He's a very busy man. And I know he says he doesn't want to do as many live shows, uh, but I hope I get the chance to see, a chance to see him live again. I did see him with Guns N' Roses in Vegas years ago, and he was amazing. But it'd be really fun to see him as a solo artist and just see kind of where the spotlight is on him the whole time. Uh, so anyways, if you enjoyed this interview, uh, check out some of the other ones I have and make sure you're following me on social media or uh, you're subscribed to the YouTube channel so you can keep up with future episodes because I do have some great interviews coming up. So thank you again for taking the time to check out my show. Have a great rest of your day. And remember, shoot for the moon. <laughs>